Hey, good morning. Pajama night at student night tonight. I feel like, um, I feel like post-COVID our whole society is in pajama night. So it's just kind of what we do now. But uh, I want to encourage you, uh, if you are a student here, if you have a student, if you know a student, if you ever interact with a student, invite them, sign them up, register them for this culture con. It is going to be great. And then again, tonight's student night is going to be a great night. I want to let you know where we're going over the next uh, several weeks. Starting next week, we are going to begin a new series over the course of Lent. Lent is... Uh, The 40 days that leads up to Easter, which is when we followers of Jesus celebrate his resurrection. And so that 40 days is a season of preparation. And and we're going to start a new uh, series that is going to be called I Believe. And what we're doing is we're going to take a deep dive into the Apostles' Creed. Many of you know the Apostles' Creed. It begins, I believe in God. And then it, it really just progresses through, uh, you know, a number of statements that really summarize the essence of the Christian faith. And, and many of you know it. Some of you maybe grew up in churches where uh, you memorized it. And, and so what we're going to do is just really try to do a deeper dive into what is it we really believe and, and why does it matter? This is a great series. If you know someone who's, who's maybe exploring faith, maybe someone's not quite settled in their faith, and also a really good series to challenge us not just to have a creed, but to live the creed. What does it look like for us to really live out our faith? So that's next week. We'll start that series. I want to welcome you back for that. Well, today we're going to continue, as David said, and actually finish our series in uh, the book of Ruth, which has been just wonderful. So uh, do any of you follow anyone? Do you look for like someone who's really inspiring to follow. Uh, If you don't have any inspiring uh, folks to follow, let me recommend to you some of the Sesame Street characters because uh, you didn't know that, but you can follow, uh, you know, Grover, Big Bird, Elmo, and uh, they're, they're just way more inspiring than like our political leaders or, you know, anyone else on Twitter. So, so uh, this week, uh, Elmo, he, he posted just like a very thoughtful question. He said, uh, he said, Elmo is just checking in. How's everybody doing? And just a really simple, like really nice, thoughtful, kind, uh, you know, question from Elmo. And it, it elicited a number of responses. Chance the rapper said, honestly, I'm in a really good place right now. Um, But that wasn't the typical response. It wasn't like chance, like I'm good. I got lots of, you know, lots of bank accounts full of lots of money. Um, The typical response was Elmo, I'm depressed and broke. Others said uh, they talked about how they were laid off. They were anxious about the 2024 election. One guy said, my wife left me. Daughters don't respect me. Job is a joke. Any more questions, Elmo? (laughs) There was a a poet and essayist who who had this response, which is by far the deepest response. Uh, Elmo, each day the abyss we stare into grows a unique horror. One that was previously unfathomable, unfathomable in nature, our inevitable doom, which once accelerated in years or months, now accelerates in hours, even minutes. <laughs> I feel like Julia could have written that, my wife. <laughs> Someone responded, Elmo, get out of here, it isn't safe. It's just like, it's just, you know, This question was viewed over 190 million times, okay? So it's not just me who's following Elmo. 190 million times. So maybe don't follow Elmo after all because it can get dark. You know, I I, I thought it was such a great example though of sort of the, the 
existential crisis that we're all experiencing in our society. Uh, and it's not that's something that's anything new, it's something that is from ages past. There's a, a wonderful book that was written 50 years ago by one of the great spiritual writers of the day, Henry Nouwen. Henry Nouwen wrote a book called The Wounded Healer. And he described a generation of young people who were wounded by this world, existentially wounded by this world, and needed the wounded healer, Jesus, and other wounded healers who were his followers to come alongside this generation. He described what a modern person in the world is dealing with, and he describes three different things. First is this sense of a historical dislocation, that we, we are disconnected from our history. That's the first thing. The second thing is fragmented ideology, that our ideologies are splintering, pulling people in all kinds of different directions. And then the third thing is a search for immortality. Now, it sounds a lot like us today, doesn't it? He says, and he describes uh, the modern person as what he calls nuclear man. He says nuclear man or woman is a person who has lost naive faith in the possibilities of technology and is painfully aware that the same powers that enable us to create new lifestyles carry the potential for self-destruction. That would have been a good thing to meditate on before social media or AI or our future, right? And so we all have this sense of being dislocated and fragmented and we're all searching for immortality. And what is the answer? What is the hope? Well, this little book of Ruth that we've been looking at, that we're finishing today, will give us some insight to the answer. It is a story, the story of Ruth is a story of a person, but it's also the story of a people. It's actually also the story of us, it's who we are. It's the story of ordinary people and excluded people and broken people. And all of us friends fit into one of those categories and some of us, I hazard to guess, fit in all three of them. But the book of Ruth doesn't just leave us in a place of loss or lostness. It moves, it moves us toward hope. There's a foreshadowing. The sense of homecoming in Ruth is a, a foreshadowing of the gospel of Jesus that gives us hope no matter what our circumstances are. And so today as we finish this series, I've called today's message, Hope for the Ordinary, the excluded and the broken. Would you pray with me? And as we pray, would you close your eyes? And I want you to think about one person in your life who is an ordinary person or an excluded person or a broken person. Just one person and I want you to bring that person right now before the Lord and we say, God, our whole world is filled with people in need of you. And God, you are the God of the ordinary and the God of the excluded and the God of the broken. And we pray, God, your mercy over the very person that we bring to our own mind today. Lord, is a representative of what our whole world needs, which is your mercy and your kindness and your grace. And indeed, God, what each one of us needs is each one of us, God, is just an ordinary person who at times feels excluded and left out and marginalized and God, at times broken and sometimes shattered. 
And God, it's only you that can put us and the whole world back together again. And so we pray, Spirit of God, that you would come and fill us and fill this place today. Lord, would you put power on your word and speak to us? I pray, Lord, a particular encouragement for each person here today. In Christ's name, amen. So we're looking at Ruth 4. If you have a Bible, you can open up to Ruth 4. We're looking, we're going to close with verses 13 to 22. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive and she gave birth to his son. The women said to Naomi, praise be to the Lord who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son. And they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. This then is the family line of Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Aminadab. Aminadab, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Salmon. Salmon, the father of Boaz. Boaz, the father of Obed, Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of David. Now, this story of Ruth is a story of a great reversal, not just a great reversal, but a great redemption. Naomi, you might remember, was struck by famine, was forced to become an immigrant, lost her husband and two sons in the new land that she came to, Moab. Well, She had no hope for a husband or a future. She has nothing except her daughter-in-law, Ruth. And Ruth loses her husband. She she chooses to stick with her mother-in-law, Naomi, and becomes an immigrant also. She has no chance for a husband or children. They've lost status. They've lost legacy. They've lost a provider. And they've lost love. They are both without hope and without a future. But then there is this great reversal here at the end of Ruth. Ruth gets Boaz, Naomi gets a son, both get a new family. Ruth came in an outsider and she goes out an insider. Naomi was a cultural zero and she ended up with seven sons. Ruth and Naomi lost their family but they gain kinsmen, redeemers. Both of them started empty, but they finished full. They are stories of how God redeems the ordinary, the excluded, and the broken. And let's begin with the ordinary, the hope for the ordinary. Now, if there's anything that we hate in America, it's the idea that ordinary things are good. Ordinary. I mean, how many of you wake up in the morning and you're like, yes, I'm looking forward to another ordinary day. I can't wait. Or uh, maybe you go to the rental car counter and, uh, and the person says to you, well, you can either have the, the uh, Kia Soul that you rented or hold on, we have an upgrade to a Maserati. Which would you like? It's a free upgrade, by the way. You don't need to do anything. Well, you know what? I really like an ordinary Kia. That's what I'm going to do. This just happened literally this week to my wife, Julia. She traveled. She went to the rental place. They literally had a Maserati. And she took the Kia. Like, only Julia. This would never happen to me. Never. How do you get the Maserati and you take the Kia? I don't understand this. Life so confounding sometimes. We hate the ordinary, don't we? It's terrible, ordinary things. Do you know what we love? 
We love the famous, don't we? We hate them too, but we love them. That's why we're enamored by them. You know, isn't fame one of the stupidest, in, stupidest inventions in human history? I mean, it really, I, I just think about it all the time. Fame, it ruins those who achieve it and it ruins those who pursue it. Did any of you see the, you know, that ridiculous clip from Mark Zuckerberg this week where he's standing in front of Congress and he's, you know, di- you know the senators dialing up the pressure. You've got all of these families It was so tragic, all of these families, parents holding up, you know, images, photographs, framed photographs of their children who, many of whom had died because of, you know, the hate that they experience on these platforms with all of these CEOs sitting in the room, uh, sexual abuse, uh, images that have, you know, proliferated the internet and many of them on these. So they, you know, turning up the pressure. What are you going to say, Mark? And he turns around. I'm so sorry for what you've experienced. No one should experience what you've experienced. And then he turns around, swears in, and he said, there is no causal link between our platforms and harm of youth. And it was like, oh my goodness, what world are we living in? You know, here is fame ruining a guy's life, ruining his reputation, and fame ruining all of these young children's lives. We know it, we see it, we experience it every day, but apparently the pursuit of fame isn't something new. The ancients even had this desire. In verse 14, the women said to Naomi, praise be to the Lord who is this day not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous, famous throughout Israel. Well, Obed didn't become famous, did he? How many of you have heard of Obed? Besides our founding pastor, Rich Nathan, none of you. You know, like, I don't know, I, you know, how many of you named your children Obed after this guy? None of you, probably. Well, it's a good name if you have. You know, it's, it's not Moses, though. It's not David, right? I mean, we have all of the stars. That's not who he was. Sure, he's somewhere in the credits. He's got a, you know, su- he's supporting there somewhere, but he's not one of the stars. God loves the ordinary. He does. Jesus came to us as ordinary to prove the point. Do you remember what Isaiah 53 says about Jesus? You know, hundreds of years before he came, he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was just a normal guy, an ordinary person in this world, as the old song said, God is one of us on the bus. You know, this desire for fame though, we know isn't just, isn't just, um, it's, it's not just something that's a manifestation of our, of our culture. It's, it's a manifestation of something deeper, which is this deeper longing for significant searching for meaning in our lives, right? We all know that. We all wake up with the, with the question every day in the back of our mind, somewhere in the back of our consciousness. What am I here for? What am I doing? What mark am I making? What, why is my life valuable? What does it matter? And then we, we you know, jump into the maze, don't we? And search all kinds of things that are going to answer that question for us. Well, I know it's my career. And so I'll work myself into significance. That's what I'll do. Well, no, that's not it for you. Maybe it's your brains. I'll smart myself into significance. Or relationships, I'll love myself into significance. Or, or maybe it's money, I'll earn myself into significance. Or, as the saying goes, or die trying. And that's the reality, right? We, we find ourselves into this maze and we hit dead end after dead end after dead end. 
and you keep running and keep running and keep running. But what does Ruth tell us the solution is to our search for significance? When you read the Bible, how many of you skip over the genealogies? Yeah, we all do. It's like, why read that? You know, the genealogies tell us something important, and in this case, what it tells us is that significance comes from trusting your life to God, to the good providence of God, to the good care of God, to the good purposes of God over generations. Here it is again, the women living there said, Naomi has a son and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the son of David. And then it goes through the line, the whole family line of Perez. And then it ends in verse 20 or in verse 21, it says, Salmon, the father of Boaz, Boaz, the father of Obed, Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of David. You see, what this genealogy tells us is that God is the one who determines your significance. You don't. All the things that you try in this life and in this world that is of your initiative to bring about significance to your life amounts to nothing. It really does. What the genealogy tells us is that it's God and his purposes, when you entrust your life to him, it is his word over your life that makes all the difference. Well, why is that? How do we see that here? You know, Ruth and Naomi became something that they never dreamed of. They never imagined in their own lifetimes what would come from their lives. And what it says here is that, the Ruth, is that Ruth is the founder of the greatest dynasty in Israel. This genealogy ends with King David. And do you know what? She's one of four women who were listed in the genealogy of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew. far into her future, long after she's dead and in the dust of the earth, God does something that she could have never imagined. And friends, if we are going to really answer the question of significance over our lives, the answer, and it's a really liberating one, is to not just entrust ourselves to God and say, God, you are the Lord of my life. It is your power and your word that speaks a better word than anything that I could do or that I could say in my life. It's not just that, but do you know what it does to liberate us? It liberates us to be the ordinary you, to be who you are. Just you, you in all of your ordinariness, you in all of your unsurprising plainness, you in all of the, I just can't really be the thing that I would like to be. And guess what? It's okay because you are loved completely as you are with nothing else to add, nothing else to do, nothing else to say. You are loved as you are. You are who you are. And God has a legacy for your life because of God, because of who he is, because of what he does in your life. Things that you'll never even know right now, God will do and is doing in your life. He's the God of the ordinary and it's liberating, but he's also the God of the excluded. The four women, I mentioned one of them who are, meant, who are mentioned in Jesus's genealogy are Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba. Now these women are women who are not the stars of the story. 
Actually, uh, in Jesus' genealogy, the stars, the women stars, are left out. There's, there's no mention of Eve or Sarah or Rebecca or Rachel or Leah. Instead, he puts in these four outsiders, women who shouldn't be there, but God says, you are going to be there because I am the God of the excluded. That is who I am, and that is what I do. I love the translation and the message version of Jesus' words in Luke chapter 5. Jesus heard about it and spoke up. Who needs a doctor, the healthy or the sick? I'm here inviting outsiders, not insiders. An invitation to a changed life, changed inside and out. Do you know Tamar was condemned to death? Rahab was a Canaanite and a prostitute. Ruth was a Moabite and Bathsheba had committed adultery with David. Jesus was so scandalously inclusive that he himself became excluded. It's incredible. And because God's hand was on these women, what we see are not weak women. What we see is not the storyline of a a typical victim playing a victim role. They are victims, yes, but they are strong women who when their backs were against the wall, they invented brilliant plans. They courageously stared death in the face and they came out vindicated on the other side. Women like Rosa Parks. You know, Rosa Parks, when she got on that bus, And she sat down and was asked to move. And you know the line, nah, I'm tired. And and she went on later and she, she explained, the only tired I was was tired of giving in. This was not a weak person. This was an ordinary person. This was an excluded person. But this was a woman who when her back was against the wall, she had power. And do you know she is the one who actually founded, started a 381 day boycott movement that actually propelled Martin Luther King Jr. to national prominence. He was not a national figure before Rosa Parks. And I wonder if there's anyone listening today where you feel that your back is against the wall. In your life, you're in a situation where your back is against the wall. And maybe you need to know God's got your back. Or maybe there's someone listening today and you've been rejected. And you need to know that God not only accepts you, but he will never forsake you. He will never leave you. This is your God. I wonder if there's anyone listening who says, I don't have a family. Who needs to know God is saying to you, that you're in my family. And that's the most important family that you could ever have. It's the God of the excluded. And also the God of the broken. You know, the world has a way of breaking us, doesn't it? I think about those who have maybe just been broken by the exhaustion of coming to a new country and just the tiredness that you feel every day of just trying to get through, trying to make it another day, trying to get food on the table, trying to take care of your kids, trying to get a green card, trying to do the next thing. Or I think about those who have been shattered by the loss of a child or a spouse like Ruth, like Naomi. Or maybe you've been broken by a breakup. Or maybe you're broken financially. You know, you look at your life sometimes and you say, how in the world is this brokenness ever gonna be put back together again? The thing I love about the story of Ruth is that it's, it's not really a happy ending in the way that you think about happy endings. It's not like a story with you know, a, a bow tied up. 
and uh, all wrapped up and everything made new again. Phyllis Tribal says this, sad stories don't always have happy endings, but sad stories may yield new beginnings. Maybe you recognize that in your own story. You know, most of us, and this is certainly true of me, whenever I look back on my life and I think about the painful things that I've experienced, the thing that I, I would say is I would never invite that pain into my life. Never, ever, ever. But now that that pain has come into my life, do you know what it's become? It's become a door to find God. It's become a door to find the grace of God and the healing of God. And it's not just become a door for me to find God and God's mercy, but it's become a door by which I can open to others. Do you ever think about like a, a painful event in your life and think about how that event has shaped you and tenderized you? There's a, a wonderful artist in our church named Co- Cody Miller. I want to show you his depiction of Ruth. Cody, he, he, this, is, this is how he painted Ruth. See, these two women who are broken by life. I imagine them on the journey from Moab to Israel. And they find this little grove of trees. And there they are, bending down for a rest, and they come across this little bird with a broken wing. And what do they do? They bandage up that wing. You know, and isn't it the case that that what happens in our lives through pain is that God tenderizes us toward the pain of others? That's the way it should be. It's not meant to harden us. It's meant to soften us and tenderize us. Let me share a story with you of someone who really gained a tender heart, Hal Donaldson. He grew up in a a pastor's home, a very poor home. And when he was a, a little boy, one evening his parents went out to a meeting and they dropped he and his three siblings off at the babysitter, left him with the babysitter. About an hour and a half later, there was a knock on the babysitter's door and there were two uniformed police officers standing on the front porch and they said, we have some really bad news. Uh, Your parents were in a terrible accident. Your father was instantly killed. And it changed his life forever. And that police officer stood on the front porch as neighbors started to gather around the front yard wondering what all of the commotion was. And the officer said, is there anyone here, any friends of this family who would take these children? And there was a young couple, the Davises, that said, we'll take them. The Davises had two children of their own. And they took these four children and they lived in a small trailer for many months. And Hal says it's because of the Davises who took them in that his heart didn't become bitter at what happened. Well, he experienced injustice and he wanted to make a difference in the world and he thought the best way to do that was to become a writer. And so he became a reporter and uh, right after college, he ended up in Calcutta, India and he was doing a, a story and he had the privilege to sit down with Mother Teresa. And he sat with Mother Teresa to interview her about her life and she turned the tables on him and she said, young man, let me ask you a question. What are you doing to help the poor and the suffering? And he looked at her and he said, well, not not much, ma'am. I'm really not doing much. And she said in a really kind way, do the next kind thing that God puts in front of you. That's all. Do the next kind thing that God puts in front of you. Well, he went back to his, his room and he just began weeping. He opened the door of his hotel room and he could hear the cries of the poor in the streets and and he sat there and wept. And he said, Lord, what should I do? What should I do? What should I do? He came home and he went to eight different cities in America and he 
lived on the streets for three days and three nights in each city, and he interviewed people on the streets. He interviewed addicts. He interviewed the homeless. He interviewed runaways. He interviewed those who were abused. And he said he was completely wrecked by that experience after visiting these cities and interviewing, sitting and sleeping with these folks. He went home and he said, what do I do? And what he did was he emptied his bank account of the $300 that he had. He went out and he went to the grocery store and he bought $300 worth of groceries. He put it in a borrowed pickup truck and he went to the migrant farm workers in the area where he lived and he just started giving out food. And he said, I had no idea what I was doing, but I knew I had to do something. And do you know that how, you know, that, that, that act, that experience from his brokenness tenderized him to become the person that he is today. And, and what came out of all of that was this incredible organization called Convoy of Hope. And the Convoy of Hope, it's in, uh, it's in over 120 countries. It's on the Forbes 100 list of the largest charities in the world. And the amazing thing about Convoy is you've never heard of it apart from Vineyard Columbus and our partnership with Convoy. And it's because of our partnership with them that you get to make a difference. And, and one of the things that we're doing this week, I just want to let you know, is we are releasing, because of your faithful giving, $25,000 toward a convoy's work in Israel and Gaza. And, you know, uh, you know, over the last several months, convoy has been there responding to the war, uh, responding to the needs of Palestinians and Israelis. And your giving is going to help continue that work through partner organiz organizations there. You see, what, what convoy does is they make the local church famous. They make Jesus famous. It's not about their name. It's about what individual people on the ground are doing to make a difference. And you are making a difference. That is Hal's life. That is his story. God opened up a door through his pain to others. And friends, he does the same with you. He does. He does the same with each one of us. Here's what I'd like to do as we close. I'd like to invite some of you to personally know and experience the kindness of God in your life. You know, every single one of us is in the category of ordinary or excluded or broken. There's no human being that is not in one of those categories. And what God has done in his kindness is he's come into this world as an ordinary person to show us that he loves ordinary people. He's come into this world as a, as a healer who became wounded on the cross so that your wounds might be healed. He came into this world as one who is excluded so that you might become included. And if there's anyone here today who has not said, Jesus, I want to be an ordinary person who is healed by your wounds, who is a part of your family, then that is the answer to the meaning of your life, I believe. It is the hope of this world, and it is the hope for every single one of us. It is not in anything else that you pursue, that you achieve, that you do in this life. It is through God and giving a son Jesus for you. And do you know what? God says all you need to do is receive him. Receive the one who's been broken. Receive the one who's been excluded. Receive the one who's ordinary, who doesn't look like anything special, who may not look like a God to you, but is God in the flesh. He says, receive him. And so what I want to do right now is invite some of you to receive this Christ into your life. You look at yourself and you say, 
I identify with one of those categories. I need Jesus. What I want to do right now is just have you bow your heads. And around the room, if you say, that's me, that's me, I want you to pray a simple prayer and say this, God, I come to you today as an ordinary person, a broken person, a person who's been excluded, a person who's experienced pain. And God, I thank you that you've come into this world to heal me, to make me new, to redeem me, to restore me. And right now, I say to you, I want you to come into my life. Would you come in and live with me? Would you come in and heal me? Would you make me whole? Would you make me new? Would you give me purpose and meaning? God, you have a plan and a purpose for my life that is so far greater than I could imagine. And today I want to embrace your purposes and your plans for my life. Today I receive you. Around the room, if you just prayed with me, would you raise your hand? If you just prayed with me, you say, I just prayed with you, Eric, just raise your hand. I prayed with you, Eric, raise your hand high so I can see you. I see you, God bless you, I see you. God bless you, I see you, I see you. A number of you up in the balcony, show me your hands. You prayed with me, just let me know. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you, I see you. You know, in a few moments, what I wanna do is if you prayed with me, I'm gonna invite you up here can invite lots of folks up, but I want you, if you just prayed with me, to come up to your right. Over here is one of our pastors, Amanda Pershing, and some of our prayer team is going to pray with you and just bless what God is doing in your life. Amen? All right. Would you stand? All of you stand. You know, I, I believe that um, there's, there's a couple of things I want to pray for this morning. One is, um, one is I, I want to pray that for some of you that some experience of pain or exclusion in your life uh, would become an experience of God's healing and grace. And maybe you're not there yet, and that's okay. Like, again, it's, it's, it's not about uh, tying things up with a bow. The, the thing I love about this image of the wounded healer is, you know, the wounds of Jesus always remained with him in his resurrection body. They were just transformed. They were transformed. You keep the wounds, but God heals them, and, and it's a process of healing. And and all of us are in a process of healing, but there's some place in your life where you say, I, this thing, this breakup, this abuse, this, this pain that I experienced uh, through my family, through, through what I thought were friends, it, it really is, it's more a place of pain and bitterness than it is of grace. And, and what I want to do is just, you don't, you, I want you to come on, you don't have to say a word, okay? It, it, this is just allowing someone to just say, Spirit of God, would you come and would you work? Would you come and would you bring your grace? So if that's you, I want to invite you up in just a moment. The second group that I want to invite up are those of you who feel like the Lord is opening a door or has opened a door toward other people that your story might turn into a blessing for others. And, and many of you are already doing this. It could be uh, in the ways that you're serving. It could be in the way that your vocation works. You're like, man, I got into my vocation because of something I experienced as a, as, you know, when I was younger. And now I'm you know, allowing this to be a door to others. And God wants to, to bless others through you. And I want to pray, it's just, it's God. It's his, his grace on you. It's not you and your story and what you do, but it's, it's his power. And I want to pray 
his power and his grace over you uh, as you walk through that door to others. So would you step out? Per ministry team, would you step out? And let's pray. Let's ask for God to, to come. If you need healing, uh, you don't have to say a word again. You just say, I just would like prayer. If you want to share, you can share, but you don't need to. We're going to have folks up here. If you are being used or you want to be used to, uh, to bring healing to others, to encourage others, then you come. And I want to pray just grace over you. And in a few moments, we'll close with uh, taking communion together.